All right. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Business Spotlight Series. My name's Coach Mark. Today, I have with me Mark Palmer, who is the founder and creative director of Omythic and Makespace as my guest. Mark's a bit of a serial entrepreneur, and he's going to share with us a little bit about his current businesses, but also his journey and his philosophy around businesses and what he's done and take a little peek at what it's really like to build and operate your own business. If you're a first-time listener, please make sure you like us and subscribe so you get notifications when our new interviews get posted, just like this one. So Mark, welcome, and thanks for being here today. Thanks. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got here. Sure. Thanks for having me here. If you want to start the educational route, when I was little, I wanted to grow up to be an artist. So when I got to be 17 and was going into college, I had, of course, developed some other interests and had narrowed down between architecture archaeology, paleontology, and art, namely sculpture. I finally whittled it down between architecture and sculpture. And of course, you know, this is the mind of a 17-year-old in action. I settled on sculpture, and my methodology was of thinking was, if a sculpture falls down, it only kills two people, uh, rather than a building falling down. And I didn't know that's what we're engineers were for. You know, I just wanted to make it pretty and cool. I didn't care about how well it really functioned as far as the stability and, and all that. So I guess it worked out. I did graduate with a sculpture degree, namely bronze and steel, uh, minor in painting and photography. That creative thing was always there innately. Mm -hmm. And then I fell into what most artists do for a living, bartending. And <laughs> I kept, I uh, promised the art gods back in 92 that if they kept sending me ideas that I would not, for lack of a better word, prostitute my fine art for a living. So let's fast forward. I'm 34, 35 years old. I, I, I graduated from bartending to selling yellow page ads. And that's really where, that's the first time I, I realized that I had a knack for this sort of thing. So it was kind of cool because I got to combine the creativity. So the right side of my brain with the left side of my brain with logic and psychology and those other things that sort of that anthropology, archaeology thing that I was interested in before, you know, sociology, way people work and act. And the two, it turns out the power of combination. And from there, my clients had come back and they'd say, this is the best yellow page ad we've ever had. What else can you do? And I'd say, well, I do logos. And that's really about it. So they were like, all right, we want you to do logos. And then right about, you know, this is way after the dot-com bust, but this is like 2004, 2005, when websites were really starting to get accessible to small business owners. And I kept telling these business owners, I'm like, look, get out of the yellow pages. This is going away. The best thing you can do with your money in the future is put it toward digital. So get a website. And they were like, I don't know how to do a website. I didn't either. So they said, well, you're my marketing guy. Go find me somebody. And this is the reason I started Makespace. I never meant to start a business. It's kind of the cool thing, I guess. And I had three, four clients. I went to the usual suspects at the time. I'm not going to mention any company names, obviously, none of which are around. And maybe this explains why. But I went to them and I said, hey, I got three clients for you. Here's some money. They said, great. Come back, you know, next Friday and we'll look at some designs. I waited for a call to set up an appointment, no appointment, no call, no nothing. And I'm like, if this is how the industry is in the, in the environment and the service, then I can do better than this. So that day I named Makespace. I said, this is a space to make something. I come from the sort of the Mike Tyson school of marketing, which is everybody has a plan until they get hit. Right. So, you know, I fancy to make space as a creative boutique, you know, and a boutique, of course, means small. <laughs> so yeah. it was just me. <laughs> so, so I said, make space. I didn't want to use my name. I had other endeavors. So ultimately I started make space out of frustration because no one was providing web development with customer service and a good experience. So I found a guy and I said, I don't have any money, but I have clients and I'll talk to the client. I'll have the vision, develop the vision with the client the goals. I'll lay them out. You design them and make them beautiful. And that's what we did. And I said, I share the product 50, 50. And that's what we did. And we grew from there. Yeah. So how big is Makespace now? Well, that's a great question. Makespace is lean and mean. We are all of eight people. Okay. okay. 
Now, it's really important to understand how we got to eight people and wow, that was intentional. So we started out with two, Dr. Rob came aboard and then we had a guy come in. He was in college and he had to do an internship in order to graduate, but he was in school for development. And he asked for an internship. We said, why not? And we threw everything we could at this kid and he did it. And he comes in at the end of his internship to give me the, the laptop that I let him borrow. And I said, hey, you want to keep that laptop? He's like, yeah, what do I have to do? I'm like, work for me. And he did. And he's still with us today. Though that's a great story. That was in, yeah. So he's 18 years in now, almost. Another thing that I think this will kind of get you to where we're going. We grew to a point where I'd say we're probably seven people at this point. And it's probably 2009. And the industry, our clients wanted more. They weren't mom and pops anymore. And they needed some more sophisticated offerings. So I was at a crossroads and I said, do I take MakeSpace and do I add additional services to it or do I develop a new brand? And we had jokingly called, if you remember the origin story about the industry being the Wild West, we jokingly called MakeSpace Louisville's least hated web development company. So, and the reason, you know, we went from this sort of boutique creative idea is because that's what people want. It turns out I was right about combining great web development and, and websites with customer service. And that's what people want. So we followed, of course, what, what our clients wanted. But as they got more sophisticated, I said, of course, I was drinking a little sake that night. A client of mine started becoming a friend and we were thinking about doing business together. We were sitting downtown one night drinking sake. And of course, you know, I drink a lot of sake and I go, ooh. Ology. He goes, what? I go, Oology. He goes, what's that? I go, that's the name of our new business. Ooh, the involuntary, almost guttural sound you make when you see something you love, like ooh. And ology, the study of. So oology. And he goes, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. And the next day we had it registered mm -hmm. and we grew quick. Turns out we were right again about what the more sophisticated services. And we went to provide all these extra services, marketing, branding, et cetera, because otherwise we're a liability by not providing them. For example, a customer would come to us and say, hey, Mark, we want web. I'm like, great, here you go. We do the best web. And they go, well, what about you know this, this, this? What about branding? What about marketing? And I'm like, well, we don't really offer that. Well, I would rather go to someplace that offers everything. So we had to develop it. We hired the right people at the right time. We grew to 86 people by 2015 or so. We were on the book of lists for business first, which was unheard of because we were only four years old as a company. And everybody on that list was at least 25 years old, somewhere a hundred, you know, like the big agencies, Doe and Scopecchio and whatnot. <laughs> and so it was unheard of. You know, we had a reputation of sort of being the rebellious company of all of them. They'd have the Louis awards and we would be conspicuously absent. Somebody entered an entry into the Louis once. We got a gold and I think it sat on the back of our toilet for six years. And then it was just gone one day behind with me. So anyway, 86 people. Then in 18, I started getting dissatisfied because my hands were no longer in the work with the clients. There were too many people between me and the client. And I would start a project off. And by the time I get back to it, the vision had changed. And I said, I need to do something where I'm closer to the client. So me and my business partner, who are, we're still great friends, we reached a, a deal. He bought most of my shares out and I went and started on Mythic. By the way, the shares included MakeSpace, Uology, some other things. I don't want, I can't go into detail, on. but then I started on Mythic. The reason I started on Mythic is because I love branding the most. I love storytelling. I love creating brands from scratch. Uh, I love renaming brands. I love recalibrating brands. People ask me what I do often. And I say, I'm a stylist for businesses is what I am. You know, if, if I make things a little more sticky than, and more attractive and more usable. So I am getting to the make space thing because it's super important. After I started on Mythic, I uh, started getting clients again that were wanting web at some point. One of the employees at New Algae became a manager at MakeSpace, was interested in MakeSpace. So she purchased MakeSpace from my former business partner. And when she did, she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, hey, how do you feel about acting as creative director 
for make space until I find somebody else. And I said, sure. So I came on as a contractor mm -hmm. and uh, that was three years ago. So, yeah. and then, so make space and a mythic often work very much hand in hand. A mythic yeah. concentrates on the branding side and make space concentrate on the web side. So when Nikki, Nikki Chin is her name. She's the managing partner and owner of MakeSpace. When she purchased it, I think that there were three or four people. So mm -hmm. now I think we're eight or so and growing. And we're growing very, very specifically, and very, very slowly, intentionally, so that we don't get into the situation in which we're in a sort of a project manager driven or mm -hmm. client driven institution. It's very important that we are creative director led because there's a reason clients hire us is because we know how to do something that they don't. Right. So it's really important that we understand what the client's vision is, translate that to what we do. And then clients let us do our work. And I can promise you every time a client lets us do our work, it's successful. So awesome. that's a lot, but that's why. So I can tell you, I'll put our web development and designs and, and conversions up to anybody in the world in terms of the website development and our conversions are seeing it. We're lean. We're mean. There is no fluff here and our prices are more than fair. They reflect that we're still full service. We're web branding. We have a full-time videographer. What's really cool is the industry has changed a lot. And I'm sure you've seen this in your coaching that back in the day, people used to come to us and say, I need more business. So you know, do some marketing, give me an awesome site and get out there and, and tell the world how awesome my business is and bring me clients. Now, more than likely, it's people saying, yeah, we need a little business, but we really need employees. So that's the biggest thing now. So we've actually added a part-time recruiter on our staff and we've developed a suite of tools that help that. You know, Don Hire Plumbing. Yeah. Don Hire Plumbing had us, what, nine years ago to do other marketing. And I got to say about three years ago, they successfully exited to an investment group. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the feathers on our hat as a sort of case study. Well, they came to us and said, Mark, look, you brought us all these clients. We're the number one home service company in the state now. Now go give me some plumbers. So, because really, if you think about recruiting, it's really recruiting certain skill sets. It's not that different than attracting a client. Right. Oftentimes, we're looking for many of the same things, right? So... What does an employee want? They want to work for a great brand with a great culture that dots their eyes and crosses their T's and it's fair and it's a pr productive and a pleasant work environment. And that's really kind of what a customer wants too from a business. Fair and thoughtful and more than about just making money. And you know, they've got their eyes on some other things, some bigger things than money. So it was pretty easy for us to add that feature on and with a web development team that's, you know, full stack, we were able to create things like job or career centers and uh, employee portals and, and those sort of tools that we can resell that really help that. Oh, okay. So that, that's how the industry has changed. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. People, you know, I talk to clients all the time. It's just, you know, recruiting is just marketing. Exactly. It's that's just, it's just marketing. Exactly it's just, you're attracting employees and, and team members instead of attracting prospective clients but it's still That's it's just right. a, it's just marketing and you have to be great at marketing both and the things that are attractive to clients to your point tend to be attractive to potential team that's members right as well. that's right and that's why we're firm firm believers in truth in branding and truth in advertising and marketing one of the checklists that we have before we take on a client is among others, is it something we want to do? Is it enough of a challenge for us where we get to flex a little bit? Can we absolutely help them? And one of them is, are they good at what they do? And are they telling the truth to their people, whether that be their employees or their client base? So if they are a great company and mean well, then my work's much easier. And when we do that, it's great because you're not building facade on anything. It's actually the branding comes from within and, and goes outward rather than creating a facade because what happens to facades eventually they crumble. Right. So it's important for us that the culture that we help with the culture of the company and that attracts both employees and clients. Yeah. So that's great. 
I knew some of that story, but not all of it. So that's awesome. And I know a lot of people don't know that story of how you got where you are, but we could spend a lot of time unwrapping some of that. But one of the things that I like to talk about is leadership. So this is kind of a two-part question. Part one is, you know, how would you describe your leadership style today? And then Mm -hmm. how has it changed over the years as you morphed from sculptor to bartender to web developer to serial entrepreneur and creative director of multiple? Yeah, that's that's a good question. First off, I do not consider myself a leader. I don't consider myself a follower either. I've been sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite a loner, but I like doing things my way and I always have. You know, grew up an only child until I was 21 years old. So you know, I'm not used to sharing. I'm not used to, you know, sometimes playing with other people. Uh, you know, that's probably one of the reasons I became an artist because I was born in 70. So we're X generation. So if you remember, it's go play, get yeah. out of here, go play. And we were feral and we occupied ourselves. So that was my mentality. And then when, I, again, to all the people out there that are listening or watching, and if you have a business, great if you don't know if you want to start a business i didn't mean to i'm so glad i did one of the cliches in the industry is you know entrepreneurs only have people that will work 80 hours to avoid working 40 but you're doing it for yourself so that makes a big big difference also brace yourself it's a roller coaster but leadership for me i became a leader i didn't want to become a leader but becoming a founder that's the natural uh state that i entered into and at first i really didn't understand it because I'm a regular guy. And when people are around me, we're chatting and this might be my employee. And I didn't realize the power that being a, their boss carried. I never thought about it. One cross word and people would be in tears or, and then I started thinking, you know, wow, this position carries a lot of responsibility. It has power. So when I realized that we went out of our way to sort of flatten our hierarchy, the way the companies were, were structured. So it wasn't nobody reported to me. I considered myself a colleague to people. And ultimately I put the leadership roles in other people's hands. I didn't even have a desk. At Uology's Peak, we, we designed this 12,000 square foot state-of-the-art office space. It was amazing. And I didn't even have a desk. I floated around or I went to Starbucks, you know, or a coffee shop or a restaurant to work. Those tendencies still die hard, that those sort of solo operator tendencies die hard. But now I like to lead by example and just go out and do the work. I don't like to hear things like, it's not my job, things like that. So one of the things that some business leaders are listening, it's really, really important to establish roles and responsibilities Mm-hmm. And to see where those cross training and opportunities are to support each other. But if I were to consider myself a leader, it would have to be just sort of by example. Let me do it and watch. It takes a lot for people to let go of things that they do to put and to delegate in the hands of others. You have to do that to grow. It takes a lot of trust. It's a process. So that's one of, that's been one of my biggest struggles is uh, leadership. Okay. What are some of the things you do? You know, you talk about employment with the economy post COVID has been a challenging one for employers. One of the keys is finding talent, but then once you have talent, what are some of the things you do to retain your team members? That's an awesome question. I'll tell you another cliche story is great. And you've probably heard this. But CEO and a CFO are talking and the CFO says, well, what if we put all all these resources and training and money and energy into this employee and they quit? And the CEO goes, well, what if we don't and they stay? So my job, and and this is going back to the leadership question also, this is probably the best example of how I've been able to be a reluctant, successful leader is through all the companies that we've had, We've graduated a lot of very successful people to go on and do their own things. Mm-hmm. We promote that. We had an employee at one time who came to us and left another agency and um, and he called me directly and I said, well, why'd you quit? And they said, well, I didn't quit. I got fired because the boss thought I was working on an app that was going to be competitive. And I said, was it competitive? And he goes, no. 
And I said, well, you got a job at Uology. And I said, work on your app on your free time. And now that app's very successful. It's not a bad thing when our employees outgrow us. It's a good thing. I want them to. That's my job is to help them get to a point where they start their own thing, right? So what, what things we do, we do a lot. We pay for, uh, they can take any class like you to me, any online class they want. If they want a book, we'll buy it. There's tons that come to us and say, I want to take this training. We'll pay for it. Anything that makes them better at the job specifically for what, what I've given them. So we go out of our way to make sure that, that people have it. Uh, but the Walgy, the, when the maternity, our maternity leave was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was the best in the industry. Mm-hmm. So the perks, you know, we want people uh, now, almost everyone works remote. You mentioned COVID. And that's fine for what we do. You know, we've got clients all over and we use this same platform that you and I are using right now. And we use it to great effect. And therefore they've got this, you know, I don't personally believe in the work-life balance thing because I don't consider what I do work. I love what I do. So it's very difficult for me to draw a line. Last night I worked till probably, you know, nine o'clock and I still almost couldn't turn it off, but I kind of didn't want to either because I love it so much. So when it comes to sort of things like how do we help people, it's, you know, we want them to be more than happy when they work with us. We don't want them to leave. And if you remember early in the story, the first guy that I said, Hey, let's make a deal. I don't have any money. He's still with us. Second guy still with us. Third guy still with us. So we have, I think three of our four first people still with us. That's so good. So now I've, I've got a few rapid questions, kind of top of the head, first thought. Yeah, answer. okay. What would you say has been your key to success? Tenacity. Uh, everybody fails. The only difference between the winners and the losers, the winners get back up. Okay, like that. So, and you may have just answered this, but what's one piece of advice you have for other business owners? Just one? Okay. Do it. It's going to get rough. There's going to be moments of joy and moments of pain and uh, to be the best you can be at your field. I mean, eat it, sleep it, drink it, embrace it, be obsessed with it, be the best you can be at it. And you'll probably find that most of your competitors will fall the wayside. Awesome. So what's a book you're reading now or have read recently that you would recommend to others? Oh, wow, man. <laughs> That's a bad question. My Audible account, uh, first off, I don't read because, I mean, those books back there I used to read. I mean, I've read most of those books, but I fall asleep these days reading. It just It's just too tactile. And oddly, I will read fiction, but I won't read non. I like to listen to nonfiction because if, if, when right. I'm exercising or I'm driving, things like that, I've got probably 400 Audible titles and if you go to my art studio, I've probably got 25 paintings that are in progress because I'll come and one will speak to me and then I want to work on that one for a while. It's the same way with my Audible. I'm reading Traction. This was referred to me recently by by the name Freddie Sarkis. This is by Gino Wickman. It's basically a business application or methodology. It's, it's been cool. I just finished Green Lights not too long ago by Matthew McConaughey. I thought that was Really, really entertaining. The dude's got some pretty cool insights. I've got The Artist's Journey, an audience of one. I know I'm not answering your question directly, but I'll give you three of the the ones that really kind of changed my life. I just finished reading The E-Myth Revisited. I I can't remember the name of the author. Mike Uh, Gerber, yeah. The day before I asked my business partner to join up because, you know, Mm -hmm. because basically the tenants in the book, uh, pitch anything but Warren class. Yep. It talks about framing. That's a fantastic one. The War of Art is great. And let me give you another one that I really thought was amazing. Napoleon Hill. Yeah. Think and Grow Rich. That's a, I mean, even though it was written in the teens or the 20s, it still holds up. Not only does it hold up, I think most of these self, you know, the business self help books that are out are kind of based on that. Mm-hmm. That's a favorite of mine as well. And I love Pitch Anything. Did you ever read the little red book of sales? Oh, yeah. I've got, all, I've got all of Gittimer's books. Uh, yeah. That was my first. I still got it somewhere. That was my first business book. 
Yeah. That I read when I was selling real estate jets. Yeah. Yeah. I'll uh, get them. Yeah. great. So what's next for Omythic? Oh gosh. Well, Omythic is churning and burning. Omythic is a little bit different. Make space will help pretty much anybody who we can, who needs it. And again, who does the right thing and offers a great partner service. Omythic is more of a private label. So we, I don't advertise. I accidentally became number one or number two on Google. If you type in branding agency, Louisville, I didn't do it on purpose. And it's a one page site, which is wild, but we're not actually looking for clients for Omythic. So Omythic is meant to be small, meant to be very mm-hmm. personable. Are you meant to be, well, go back to our first conversation, Boutique by Design. I've got a really cool webisode coming out. It's called A Life Well Lit. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be filming it starting in December down at the Little Thoroughbred Society. And it's myself and Jason Shepard from J. Shepard Cigars and a couple other entrepreneurs. We've got Joe Daly. I don't know if you know him, but uh, another entrepreneur uh, who's very big in the mixology and hospitality scene. Here's the premise. We're all sitting around. It's a men's a lifestyle series. And Jason Shepard comes out. And it's kind of like well lit for a reason. It's a double entendre. Jason Shepard comes out and he says, all right, today we're going to smoke. Let's say he says, today we're talking about relationships, men's interest, some, some kind of topic. So I've got a spicy cigar for that. And it's, you know, all he knows everything that you know, want to know and don't want to know about cigars. Yeah. So mm-hmm. he's going to tell it and all the notes and all that. And then we'll have Joe match that with a bourbon or a wine or a beer. And then we still introduce the guest. And it's just sort of a, like you and I are doing now. It's just sort of everybody's talking. Our first guest is going to be Wes Henderson of Angels Envy. Right. And we're trying to get Rocky Patel or Jonathan Drew. They're big okay. in the cigar. And then we'll go from there. So we'll have athletes. We'll have experts in their field. And that's got some exciting things going along with it as well as there's a directory that's a part of that. So it's going to be called Lit Louisville, L-I-T, Louisville. And then we've got my, my business partner, Nikki Chen, and I. And Joe Daly have a bolt on for make space. It's called Formulae. And we're targeting and servicing people in the hospitality and liquor and other adult ingestible sort of like so CBD in the booze industry. Yeah. So there's a lot going on. A couple other things past that. I'm not privy to say just yet, but suffice it to say that there's a lot going on. And I feel like I'm just getting started. Okay. Awesome. So if somebody wanted to talk to Nikki about websites, what's the best way to get a hold of somebody at MakeSpace? MakeSpaceWeb.com. Or you can just type in Web Design in Louisville. We're mm-hmm. usually number one right there. We've been number one for probably 10 years. I don't like searching that position, but we're good at it. It's tedious. But yeah, MakeSpaceWeb.com. And if anybody's interested, we have just launched a series where we're documenting our own rebrand. So we're still make space, but we're doing a very thorough brand recalibration. It's been 10 years almost since our website's been up and that's in technology. That's, that's a long time. So we've got a state of the art stuff coming out, but we have documented every step of the recalibration of the brand and the build of the website. And it's almost real time. We're about a month behind. So by the time the video comes out, we're only about a month ahead of that. So, and we're doing that to show people how to, to undergo the process if they want to try to undertake it themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first episode came out on social, on Facebook, probably a week ago or so, a little bit longer. And the next one will come out this coming week. And it'll be 11, I believe, total. And it'll have the whole gamut from soup to nuts on how to do a full brand, brand recalibration, including all the applications such as web, business cards, all the usual suspects. So if you want to check that out, I'll let you know yeah. via LinkedIn Yeah, if you want to check. Yeah, let me know when that's ready, and then I can share it out. I would appreciate it. All right, yeah. last question for you today, Mark. All right. What is most inspiring <laughs> to you right now? I don't want to quote my buddy and client, Hans Poppy, probably the best attorney in the region. He says, discipline, and as a creative guy, this kind of hurts me a little bit, but I, the older I get, I think the more it might be true. He says, discipline over inspiration. Inspiration comes and goes, but self-discipline you can count on. And he's right, but that's no fun, right? So what inspires me is, you know, every morning I get get up and I go, what can I make today? What is going to exist in the evening that didn't exist when I woke up? 
And that's really what ignites me and gets me out of bed and, and out hustling. I love that answer. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, that kind of wraps up our interview. This has been Mark Palmer, founder and creative director, of Make Space and Omythic and serial entrepreneur. Really appreciate you sharing your story, Mark, and some of your approaches and just philosophies, because that's what makes us all unique as business owners. I'd like to thank everybody for watching and listening today. Uh, this is uh, Coach Mark with Action Coach Bluegrass, and we'll see you again soon on our next episode. Thanks for now. Bye.